Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com, DwyerRealty.org, KeepingItFree.Blogspot.com. I'm a lawyer in Northern California. Uh, I'm also a realtor. Uh, check out my websites. And uh, from time to time, I comment on cases in the news. And I'm absolutely astonished, really surprised, by the outcry over making a murderer. I believe that people are having a problem digesting too much information, right? People start to get sidetracked on, you know, uh, whether this cop should have been at the crime scene and, you know, whether there's some relationship between a, you know, prior civil case involving Stephen Avery and the criminal case. Uh, folks, understand, I believe, you can literally exclude most of the evidence. You don't have to consider things like the bullet evidence and the key inside the house and things like that. You don't have to consider any of it, right? You don't even have to consider his blood in her car, right? Or his DNA, not blood DNA, but touch DNA under her hood to reach the conclusion that either he's guilty or he's the unluckiest man in the world. Let's go through some facts that we can all agree on that don't involve the cops, that don't open the door to this idea of a police frame-up, right? Let me just say too, as longtime viewers here on Dwyer Crime Channel here on YouTube know, Many times I question investigations. Many times I don't believe the police version of events. Right? I'm a skeptic of law enforcement. But even with that skepticism, I believe that this is the wrong case to question the guy's guilt. Let's talk about it. Right? Now let's talk about why Stephen Avery would have to be the unluckiest man in the world for the evidence to break how it's broken, right? Now, we know that the victim, Miss Hallback, had previously visited Stephen Avery, right, on a previous work assignment, and that she was privately creeped out by him because he, according to reports, answered the door wearing a towel, Right? She apparently told some people she worked with. So, by chance, she's creeped out by him. Now let's fast forward right to the relevant time period. By chance, not knowing that she's creeped out by him, Stephen Avery calls her employer and specifically asks that the employer send her out to take photographs, right? He specifically asks for her. And then, in a second wrinkle, he uses someone else's name, right? Think about those coincidences right there, right? She's creeped out by him. He asked for her using someone else's name, right? By chance, he then makes two, not one, but two, star 67 calls to her phone, right? Two, to mask his identity, right? If you believe he's innocent, then these are just some random, odd, unlucky coincidences. We get the coup de grace, right? After she meets with him, by his own admission, right? We know she comes out there. The day she goes missing. We know that. He doesn't question that. We know that he actually interacts with her that day. 
He doesn't question that. Right? There's no question that they interact that day, that they meet that day. Right? He's conceded it. But by chance, in what would have to be the most bizarrest of coincidences, he then decides, without Star 67, to call her phone that afternoon after meeting with her. And if you believe it's a coincidence, right, in a moment of insanity, says, hey, where are you? Right? You know, I'm here at the house. Right? Pretends that they did not meet that day. And, of course, by chance, she goes missing. Right? So you have Avery engaging in odd behavior. Right? Send her over. Here's a name other than mine. Right? I know people are going to say, oh, he gave her his sister's name because it was his sister's car. Right? Understand, he had met her previously, decides not to use his name. Then he star 67 -ing her. Right? Which would be consistent with someone trying to hide their identity. Right? Well, Let's go one step further. Show how bizarre the coincidences would have to be. By chance, Stephen Avery has a bloody cut that day. Right? Just by chance. Understand, if he doesn't have the bloody cut, then it's that much harder to smear his blood places and have people think that it's his blood. Understand, I could have blood from his prior criminal case, but that blood isn't useful to me unless Stephen Avery happens to be bleeding on that day. And guess what? Here's a surprise. On a day where he asks for the murder victim to come meet him, hides his identity in multiple calls, guess what? He has a cut at the end of that day. That is a bloody cut. Right again, he would have to be the most unlucky man on the face of the world to have all of this happen to him. Right? Wouldn't you have been more convinced if his defense attorneys would have said, this blood can't be Stevens. Here are his hands. No cuts. Here's his torso. No cuts. How would this blood get in the car? Right? Think about it. Right? How would it? Let's also talk about another odd coincidence. Right? By chance. Stephen Avery starts a bonfire that day, right? Everyone admits that, right? Neighbor sees the bonfire. Brandon Dassey's supposed to have been at the bonfire, right? Everyone sees Stephen Avery with a bonfire that day, right? Third party sees Stephen Avery tending to the fire. There's no question Stephen Avery is tending to a fire, and, of course, that's exactly how, right, he's supposed to have been framed. Because, of course, the murder victim's bones end up in the fire pit that Stephen Avery, by chance, just happened to be tending the day she goes missing. Right? Let's talk about some other coincidences. People don't talk about this enough. When you focus on the evidence... Shouldn't you also focus on the absence of evidence, right? Stephen Avery's sister lives next to him, right? Uh, he's living among family, 
right? I believe one of the roads by him is Avery Road, right? Brandon Dassey's supposed to be his nephew, right? You got a bunch of people living around him who are family. Now, let's say Teresa Hallback came, met with Stephen Avery, and left as he contends, right? Don't you think it's strange that none of his family members, not one, see whoever is supposed to have framed him return on the property with her vehicle, right? I'm, I'm guessing if she leaves her meeting with Stephen Avery, right, you would imagine she'd drive off the property. That means whoever framed him would have to then get in her car and drive that car back onto the property. Now, Avery works with family members. He has employees. He has relatives living around him. Aren't you a little bit surprised that not one of them says, hey, I saw this cop or these cops or this teenager pull up in Teresa Hallback's car and park the car over there, right? Keep in mind, too, the person didn't just park the car and then open the door and run out, right? Because they would have to frame him, right? Have his blood, have his DNA, then even if they did a quick job inside the car, just putting blood here and there, right? Then leaving the car, they'd have to pop the hood. Think about it, right? Pop the hood, put some of his DNA in the hood. Okay, great, right? Understand after doing that at the scene, even if you want to say, hey, they could have smeared some blood before they drove the car over there, which isn't quite plausible. But understand, at the scene, the person would then have to put the shrubbery and, you know, stuff on the car. You remember there's some shrubs and stuff like that, you know, a piece of wood on the car to try to hide the car. In other words, the person, if you believe he's framed, who drops the victim's car back off, would actually have to linger by the car a minute. Right? Aren't you at all disturbed that not one person, not a worker, not a relative, he has family all around him. No one sees anyone drop that car there. Let me tell you, if you want to bust police for framing someone, I mean, you know how many cameras are all around now. If there was any footage whatsoever of a cop driving a murder victim's car to an alleged crime scene after that murder victim goes missing, that would be prima facie evidence of a frame-up. Here, Stephen Avery would have to be the unluckiest man in the world. None of his relatives, none of his neighbors, None of his employees. Keep in mind, he has family working for him. None of them see any third party return with the victim's car. None of them. None of them. Right? So... I don't think you have to get into the key. I don't think you really have to get into, you know, the bullet. I think just Stephen Avery's admitted actions and just common sense on the implausibility of a frame-up should establish that he did this crime. Right? The prosecution, now I'll agree, they introduce a lot of evidence. 
I believe it's a different question on whether the prosecution went about this the right way. That's a different question than whether Stephen Avery actually did the crime. Whether there's enough evidence to convict him. Right? I, I personally believe that here the evidence is overwhelming. Just like OJ. You mean to tell me when the victim goes missing, Avery has a fresh bloody cut? Doesn't that by itself raise suspicion? You know, I'll even go further. If OJ, different case, but if OJ had called Nicole the day of her murder and used Star 67, wouldn't you be suspicious? Stephen Avery does so multiple times. Multiple times. And uses a different name. Right? Could you imagine the OJ case if after Nicole goes missing? Let's say people didn't realize that she was right in front of the condo. Could you imagine OJ calling her and saying, Hey, where are you? And then later having to admit that, yeah, she did make her appointment with me earlier that day. So why do we get the, hey, where are you, call? That, by the way, curiously, doesn't use star 67. Right? Some people here online are trying to say, hey, Stephen Avery had some notoriety. Of course he would try to hide who he was then isn't it a very unlucky coincidence that that last call he makes to Hallback doesn't involve Star 67? Right? So I don't need to get into Brandon Dassey. I don't need to get into his confession. Right? Whether he was coerced, the information he provides. Right? My focus can actually stay on Stephen Avery. Right? Fresh, bloody cut. The day she goes missing. His own phone calls to her. Right? The absence of any evidence that anyone saw anyone driving her, you know, vehicle, her RAV4, back onto the property after she supposedly left. Right? Stephen Avery claims that he met with her and then she left. Right? There's no evidence of anyone returning her vehicle to the property. None whatsoever. Right? Let me also say, too, and I understand, many people are going to try to throw a lot of different facts out there. Right? But it is a fact that the bones were found with, you know, tire parts also in the burn pit, right? There's little doubt, little doubt, that at least a part of Teresa Hallback's body, in fact, most of her body, was burned in that burn pit. Right? Very little doubt because of how it's intertwined with tire parts. Right? You know, understand, Stephen Avery's case would be a lot stronger if he just happened to have not used the burn pit by his own admission. Right? The evening that the murder victim goes missing. But he did. Let me close with this. Understand that Stephen Avery these days is now trying to point the finger not at law enforcement alone, but at his relatives. Right? He's trying to claim that he was framed 
and he understands blaming law enforcement is so implausible that he now is trying to blame the relatives who didn't see anyone return to the property with Teresa Hallback's car. Right? You know, all I can say about that is that just shows you the level of desperation. Right? Think about it. You really have to ask yourself, would family be able to frame him this way? Aren't you a bit disturbed at the location of the burn pit relative to his house? Do we really believe that family members are going to be organized enough to know how to sneak bones into, you know, his burn pit that's right by his house? Keep in mind, Avery admittedly had firearms in the house, right? Think about that. Right? If I'm a friend of Avery's, right? One of the firearms is supposed to be right in the bedroom, right? Hanging up on the wall or something like that. If I'm a friend of Avery's and I'm trying to carry around either a corpse to burn in Avery's fire pit or bones to put into Avery's fire pit, don't I have to be mindful of the fact that Avery is armed and can defend himself? Right? So to me, the family angle seems even more preposterous. If you're going to blame family, then ask yourself, right? If you're blaming the police, I believe the operative theory isn't that the police killed Teresa Hallbach. Rather, it's that police found her body someplace and then came up with the great idea of moving the body to Stephen, uh, Stephen's burn pit, right? Or at least burning the body and then <laughs> moving the bones to his bird pit and taking the car back onto his property. Now think about how preposterous and high risk both of those would be and how many people that would involve. And of course, uh, conspiracy theorists want you to believe that that plot also involved taking the blood from the earlier case, smearing the blood in the vehicle, and then finding a rag or something of Stephen Avery's and then smearing that touch DNA under the hood, right? But most of the people blaming the police don't think that the cops killed Teresa Hallback. Well, think about it. If relatives are supposed to have, I can't even keep a straight face here. If relatives are supposed to have framed Stephen Avery, right? If, if relatives are supposed to have framed him, then who killed Teresa Hallback? Did, did a relative come out and find her body and then decide, okay, let's cremate the body? Is that remotely believable to you? And let's put the bones in, you know, Cousin Stevens or uh, Uncle Stevens' burn pit? Come on. You know, so understand. Stephen Avery is very guilty, right? His own actions speak to his guilt. His own theories on how the crime was committed are highly implausible. The evidence just doesn't support the idea of anyone returning to his property with the victim's vehicle, right? Understand, the way the blood was stored is normal. Right? The little hole at the top, according to many experts, you'll find that more often than not. But do you believe that whoever frames Stephen Avery is sophisticated enough to mix that blood evidence with touch DNA? Also, when exactly are the police supposed to have figured out that Stephen Avery had a fresh, bloody cut on his hand? Right? Who's supposed to have met with Stephen Avery and then noticed the cut and then thought, hey, this makes smearing blood in the victim's vehicle plausible? Right? So count me among those who 
are skeptical of law enforcement, are skeptical of state investigations, right? But who firmly believe that this guy is very guilty, right? Again, he would have to be extremely unlucky to have chosen the day that a visitor goes missing, right? He wouldn't even know she's going missing. To call her after she's met with him and to leave a phone message of, hey, where are you? Right? That call by itself reeks of a cover-up and a consciousness of guilt. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at DwyerRealty.org if you're looking for real estate, RichardDwyer.com for uh, legal advice, or KeepingItFree.blogspot.com for political commentary. Thanks for stopping by.